the Jews got together on the basis of being Jews. The Irish got together on the basis of being Irish. Now, what basis you and I want to get together on? We've got to have some kind of basis. But as soon as we mention the only basis that we've got to get together on, they trick us by telling our leaders, you know, that anything that's all black is put segregation in the grass. <laughs> Isn't that what they said? So, so the people who are black don't want to get together because they don't want to segregate you. See, the man is tricky, brothers and sisters. I mean, the man is tricky. He's a master of tricks. And if you don't realize how tricky he is, he'll have you maneuver right on back into slavery. I shouldn't say back into slavery because we're not out of it yet. He's a trap that he creates. If you uh, speak in an anger, in a angry way about what has happened to our people and what is happening to our people. What does he call it? Emotionalism. Think about it. Here's a man who's got a rope around his neck. Well, he's screaming, you know. If the crap that is putting the rope around his neck accuses him of being emotional. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is a you're supposed to have the rope around your neck and holler politely, you know. You're supposed to watch your diction. Not shout and wake other people up. This is how you go to holler. You're supposed to be respectable and responsible when you holler uh, against what they're doing to you. And you've got a lot of black girlfriends who fall for that. They say, no, we can't do it like that. you got to be responsible. you got to be respectful. And you will always be a slave. As long as you're trying to be responsible and respectable in the eyesight of your master, you will remain a slave. Uh, when you're in the outside of your master, you've got to let him know you're irresponsible. And you will blow his irresponsible head. <laughs> then again, you've got another trap that he maneuvers you into. If you begin to talk about what he did to you, he'll say that's hate. He's teaching hate. Think about that. He won't say he didn't do it. Because he can. But he'll accuse you of teaching me. Just because you begin to spell out what he did to you. Which is an intellectual trap. Because he knows we don't want to be accused of teaching. And the average a black American who has been real brainwashed, he never wants to be accused of being emotional. You ever watch it? You ever watch one of them? Yeah, if you watch it, watch it. They're real bourgeois. Uh, black American. He never wants to show any sign of it, but you won't even have his teeth. You can have some of it, some real soul to you. And he'll sit there, you know, like it doesn't move him. <laughs> I watch him, I'm saying. And the reason he's trying to pretend like it doesn't move him, he knows it doesn't move him. And if it doesn't move him, but they can't see it. They got no soul. <laughs> and, and he's got to pretend he has none. Just to make it with them. This is a shame. Really. And then you go a step farther, they get you again on this violence. You, they have a, another trap wherein they make it look criminal if any of us, again, who has a rope around his neck or, or one is being put around his neck, if you do anything to stop the man from putting that rope around your neck, that's violence. And again, this bourgeois. Negro, who's trying to be polite and respectable and all, he never wants to be identified with violence. So he lets them do anything to him. And he sits there uh, submitting to it non violently just so he can keep his image of responsibility. He dies with a responsible image. He dies with a polite image. But he dies. <laughs> the man who's irresponsible and impolite, he keeps his life. But that responsible Negro, he'll die every day. But if the irresponsible one dies, and take some of those with him who are trying to make him die. So the era that we're living in is an era in which we see the people in the east on the rise and the people in the west on the deep line. That is, the dark world is rising and the white world or western world is having its power curtailed. This is happening and it's happening every day. Even in the state right there in Saigon, 
in uh, South Vietnam. Don't you realize that 20 years ago, those little people over there didn't have a chance? All they needed would be a, a battleship to sail up to the coastline. And everybody over there would bow down, get the boss. That's how they said it, same as you said it over here. But not now. Now they don't get to nobody's boss. They get them a rifle and run boss and eat them out of there. <laughs> the entire piece, the God world, is on the rise. Whether you like it or not. If the God world rises up, it puts the, the white world on the spot. It puts the Western world on the spot. And it puts you and me on the spot. Why does it put us on the spot? Because although we're in the West, we're from the East. Many, many black Americans don't realize this. You are not of the West. You are in the West. You're not a Westerner. You're from the East. You're not white. You're in the right world. That doesn't make you white. You're as black as you ever were. But you're just in the right world. <laughs> and next month they'll come up to show you another trick. They'll come at you and me next month with this Negro History Week, they call it. And during this week, it comes around once every year. And during this one week, they uh, drowned us in propaganda about Negro history in Georgia and Mississippi and Alabama. Never do they take us back across the water back home. They take us down home, but they never give up the history of back home. They never give us enough information to let us know what were we doing before we ended up in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Texas, and some of those other prison states. They give us the impression with Negro History Week that we were cotton pickers all of our lives. Cotton pickers, uh, orange growers, men and uncles for the white man in this country. This is our history when you talk in terms of Negro History Week. They might tell you about one or two people who, who took a peanut and, and made another white man rich. George Washington Powell, and he was a scientist. But he died broke. He made four rich. So he wasn't doing anything for himself and his people. He got a good name for us. But what did we get out of time? The master got it. It's like a dog who runs out in the woods and grabs a rat. No matter how hungry the dog is, does he eat it? No. He takes it back and blames it at the boss of speaking. And the boss skins it, takes the meat, and gives the dog the bone. And the dog is going right on hungry again, but he didn't know. He could have gotten the rabbit and ate it for a shot. And the boss wouldn't even have caught it in the window. So he can outrun the boss. But it's the same way with you and me. Every contribution we make, we, we don't make it for our people. We make it for the man. We make it for our master. He gets the benefit from it. We die, and not for our people. We die for him. We don't die for our home and our house. We die for this house. We don't die for our country. We die for this country. A lot of you all were fools on the front line. Were you not? Yes, you were. You put on the, the, the uniform and went right up on the front line like a roaring hound dog, bopping for man. And when you come back here, you'll have to bop when you got back. So Negro history week reminds us of this. It doesn't remind us of past uh, achievements, but it reminds us only of the achievements we made in the Western Hemisphere under the tutelage of the white man. So that whatever uh, achievement that was made in the Western Hemisphere that the spotlight is put upon, this is the white man's true way of taking credit for whatever we accomplished. But he never lets us know of an accomplishment that we made prior to being brought here. This is another trick. The worst trick of all is when he names us Negro and calls us Negro. And then when we call ourselves that, we end up tricking ourselves. As my brother Cassius was on the uh, uh, screen the other night talking with Les Green about the word Negro. I wish he wouldn't have gone so fast that he, he was in a position to have done a very good job. And, uh, but he was right in saying that we're not Negro. And have never been until we were brought here and made into that. We were scientifically produced by the white man. And whenever you see somebody who calls himself a Negro, he's a product 
of Western civilization, not only Western civilization, but Western crime, the, the Negro, as he is called, or calls himself, in the West, is the best evidence that can be used against Western civilization today. One of the main reasons we're called Negro is so we won't know who we really are. And when you call yourself that, you don't know who you really are. You don't know what you are, you don't know where you came from. You don't know what is yours. And as long as you call yourself a Negro, nothing is yours. No language, you can't lay claim to any language, it's not even English. You mess it up. You can't, you can't lay claim to any name, any, any type of name that, that will identify you as something that you should be. You can't lay any claim to any culture as long as you use the word Negro to identify yourself. It attaches you to nothing. It doesn't even attach, it doesn't even identify your color. If, if you talk about one of them, they call themselves white. Don't they? Or they might call someone else Puerto Rican to identify them. Mind, mind you how they do this. When they call him a Puerto Rican, they are giving him a better name. Because there is a place called Puerto Rico, you know. They at least let you know where he came from. So they say, whites, Puerto Ricans, and Negroes. Pick up on that. That's a drag, brother. White is legitimate. It means that's what color they are. Puerto Rican tells you that there's something else named somewhere else that they hear now. Negro doesn't tell you anything. I mean nothing. Absolutely nothing. What do you identify with? Tell me. Nothing. What are you attached to? What do you attach to it? Nothing. It's completely in the middle of nowhere. And when you call yourself that, that's where you are, right in the middle of nowhere. It doesn't give you a language, because there's no such thing as a Negro language. It doesn't give you a country, because there's no such thing as a Negro country. It doesn't give you a culture, there's no such thing as a Negro culture. It doesn't exist. The land doesn't exist. The, the uh, culture doesn't exist. The language doesn't exist. And the man doesn't exist. They take you out of existence by calling you a Negro. And you can walk around in front of them all day long from then on and they act like they don't even see. Because you made, you made yourself not existent. It's a person who has no history. And by having no history, he has no culture. Just as a tree without roots is dead, a people without history or cultural roots also become a dead people. And when you look at us, those of us who are called Negro, we're called that because we're like a dead people. We, can, we, we have nothing to identify ourselves as part of the human man. You know, you take a, a tree, you can tell what kind of tree it is by looking at the leaves. If the leaves are gone, you can look at the bottom and tell what kind it is. But when you find a tree with the leaves gone and the bark gone, Everything gone, you call that a what? A stump. And you can't identify a stump as easily as you can identify a tree. And this is the position that you and I are in here in America. Formerly, we could be identified by the names we wore when we came here. When we were first brought here, we had different names. When we were first brought here, we had a different language. And this, these names and this language identified the culture that we were brought from. The land that we were brought from. And in, in identifying that, we were able to point toward what we had produced. Our net worth. But once our names were taken and our language was taken and our identity was destroyed and our roots were cut off with no history, we became like a stump, something dead, a twig, over here in the Western Hemisphere. And anybody could step on us, trample on us, or burn us, and there'd be nothing that we could do about it. Those of you who are religious, who go to church, there are stories in the Bible that can be used easily to pretty well tell the condition of the black man in America once he became a Negro, where they refer to him there as the lost sheep, meaning someone who's lost from his own kind. That's him, which is how you and I have been for the past 400 years. We've been in a land where we are not citizens, or in a land where they treated us as strangers. Or they have another uh, symbolic story in there called the, uh, the dry bones. And many of you have gone to church Sunday after Sunday and got, you know, 
the ghost, they call it. What happened? And started talking about it. When the old preacher started singing about dry bones, you knock over benches. Just because he was singing about the bones, those dry bones, I don't know how to say that. But you never could identify the symbolic meaning of those bones. How they were dead because they had been cut off from their own time. And our people here in America have been in the same condition as those dry bones that you sit in church singing about. But you shed more tears over those dry bones than you shed over yourself. This is going to show what happens to a people when they are cut off and stripped of everything like you and, you and I have been cut off and stripped of everything. We become a people like no other people. And we are a people like no other people. No other people on earth like you and me. We're, we're unique. We're different. They, they say that we're Negroes, and they say that Negro means black, but yet they don't call all black people Negroes. You see the, the contradiction? Mind you. They say that we're Negro because Negro means black in Spanish. Yet they don't call all black people Negroes. Something there doesn't add up. And then to get around it, they say uh, uh, mankind is uh, divided up into three categories, mongoloid, caucasoid, and, uh, and Negro. Now pick up on that. And all black people aren't Negro. They got some jet black ones that they classify as caucasoid. But if you'll study very closely, all of the black ones that they classify as caucasoid are those that uh, still have great civilization or still have the remains of what was once a great civilization. And the only ones that they classify as Negro are those that they find with no evidence that they were ever civilized. Then they call them Negro. But they can't afford to let any black-skinned people who have evidence that they formerly occupied a high seat in civilization, they can't afford to let them be called Negro. So they take them on into the Caucasoid classification. And actually, Caucasoid, Mongoloid, and Negro, there's no such thing. These are so-called anthropological terms that were put together by anthropologists who were nothing but agents of the colonial powers, and they were purposely given that status. They were purposely given such scientific uh, positions in order that they could come up with definitions that would justify the European domination over the African and the Asian. So immediately they invented classifications that would automatically demote these people or put them on a lesser level. All of the problems for us are, are the high level. The Negro are the kept at a low level. This is just plain trickery that their scientists engage in in order to keep you and me thinking that we are we never were nothing. And therefore, well, he's doing us a favor as he lets us step upward or forward in his particular society or civilization. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Now then, once you see that, that the condition that we're in is directly related to our lack of knowledge concerning the history of the black man, only then do you realize the importance of knowing something about the history of the black man. And the black man's history, when you refer to him as a black man, you go way back. But when you refer to him as a Negro, you can only go as far back as the Negro goes. And when you go beyond the shores of America, you can't find the Negro. So if you go beyond the shores of America in history, looking for the history of the black man, if you're looking for him under the term Negro, you won't find him. He doesn't exist. So you end up thinking that you didn't play any role in history. But if you want to take the time to do research for yourself, I think you'll find that on the African continent, there, has all, there was always, prior to the discovery of America, there was always a higher level of history, a higher, rather a higher level of culture and civilization than that which existed in Europe at the same time. At least 5,000 years ago, they had a, a black civilization in uh, the Middle East, what they can have, in the Middle East, uh, called the Sumerians. Now when they show you pictures of the Sumerians, they try to make you think that they were white people. But if you go and read some of the ancient manuscripts, or even read between the lines on some of the current uh, writers, you'll find that the Sumerian civilization was a very dark-skinned civilization, and it, it existed prior even to the existence of the Babylonian Empire, right in the same area where you find Iraq and the Tigris, the Great uh, Rivers there. It was a, a black-skinned 
people who lived there, who had a high state of culture way back then. And at a time even beyond there, there was a black-skinned people in India who were black, just as black as you and I, called Dravidians. They uh, inhabited the uh, subcontinent of India even before the present people that you see living there today. And they had a high state of culture. And the present people of India even looked upon them as gods. Most of their statues, if you'll notice, are, 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 have pronounced African features. You go right to India today, in their religion, which is called Buddhism, and they give all their Buddhas the image of a black man with his lips and his nose and his, even show his hair all curled up on his head. His hair didn't, they didn't curl it up. It was born. He was born that way. And these people lived in that area before the present people of India lived there. They lived, the black man lived in the Middle East before the present people who are now living there lived there. And he had a high culture and a high civilization. To say nothing about the oldest civilization of all that he had in Egypt among the best of the night. And when and in uh, conference in uh, in North West Africa, another part of the country, and at a later date in uh, Mali and, and uh, uh, Ghana and Tonga and some of the, and, and the Moorish civilization, all of these civilizations existed on the African continent before America was discovered. Now, the the, the black civilization that shook the white man up the most was the Egyptian civilization. And it was a black civilization. It was along the bank of the Nile, which went through the heart of Africa. But again, this is tricky white man, and he's tricky. And my people didn't want to say this. It's not a racist thing. Some of them might be tricky, but all of my men are tricky. And, and his civilization showed this trickiness. This tricky white man that was able to take the Egyptian civilization, write books about it, put pictures in those books, make movies for television and, and, and the theater. So skillfully done until he had even convinced other white people that the ancient Egyptians were white people themselves. They were African. They were some African as you and I. And he even gave the clue away when he made his movie King Solomon's Lines. And he showed the Watusis, you know, with their black spells. And he outright admitted in there that they looked like the ancient pharaohs of ancient Egypt. Which means that the white man himself, he knows that the black man had this high civilization in Egypt. Which today the remains show the black man in that area had mastered mathematics, had mastered architecture, had put uh, the building, the art of building, science of building things, had even mastered that, that uh, astronomy. The pyramid, as the white scientists admit, is constructed in uh, such a position on this earth to show that the black people who were the opposite color had a, had a knowledge of uh, geography that was uh, so vast they knew the exact center of the earth's land mass because the base of the pyramid is located in the exact center of the earth's land mass which it could not have been so situated by its architect, unless the architect in that day had known that the earth was round and had been knew how much land there was in all directions from where you were in. <laughs> and, the, and the pyramid was built so many thousand years ago that they don't even know the exact time that it was built. But they do know that the people who brought it into existence were, had mastered the science of building, had mastered the various sciences of the earth, and had natural astronomy. I read one where one scientist said that the architect of the pyramid had built a shaft that uh, went outward from the center of the pyramid, where in the uh, place where it uh, marked in the sky was the location where a star, a blue star, I think, is some kind of star, made an appearance only once every 50,000 years. Now, they said that this architect's knowledge of astronomy was so vast that he evidently had access to histories or records that uh, spotlighted the existence of a star that made its appearance at a certain spot in the sky only once every 50,000 years. Now, he could not have known this unless he had records going back 
beyond 50,000 years. Yet the pyramid is a living witness today that the black people who were responsible for bringing it into existence had this kind of knowledge. And when you read the, the uh, opinions of the white scientists about the pyramid and the builders of the pyramid, they don't make any secret at all over the fact that they marvel over the scientific ability that was in the possession of those people way back then. They had mastered uh, chemistry to such extent they could make the case that the dye has not, the color doesn't fade right
people weren't brought, our people weren't brought right here to this country. They were first dropped off in the West Indian Islands, in the Caribbean. Most of the slaves that were brought from Africa was, were dropped off first in the Caribbean, West Indian Islands. Why? This was the great Indian ground. They would break the men down there, and as they broke the men, then they would bring the ones whose spirit had been broken onto America. They had all kinds of methods of breaking the men. They bred fear into them, for one thing. I read in one book how the slave maker used to take a pregnant woman, black woman, and make her watch as her man would be tortured or put to death. One old slave maker had trees that he planted in, in positions where he could uh, bend them and tie them and then tie the hand of a black man to one and the hand to the other and his legs to two more. And he cut the rope. And when he cut the rope, that tree would snap up and pull the arm of the black man right out of his side. Pull him, pull him up in the four different parts. I'll show you both when you read it. They read about it. And they make the pregnant black women stand there and watch as they did it, so that all this grief and fear that they felt would go right into that baby, that black baby that was yet to be born. It would be born afraid, born with fear. And you got it in you right now. Right now, you still got it. When you get in front of that blue eyed thing, you start to itch it, don't you? And you don't know why. It was, it was bred into it. But when you find out how they did it, you can get it out of it and put it right back in there. No, I'm not talking racism. I'm not talking to you. You can get it out of it and put it right back in there. No, I'm not talking racism. I'm not talking to you. They used to take a black woman who would be pregnant and tie her up by her clothes, let her be hanging head down. And while that little, while the baby, and she, they would take a knife and cut her stomach open, let that black unborn child fall out, and then stomp its head in the ground. They only got a few minutes after I'm trying to go fast. I'm kind of tired, so I can't go to that, we have to But I want to get the rest of this out. They used to take a black woman who would be pregnant and tie her up by her toes, let her be hanging head down. And while that little, while the baby, and she, they would take a knife and cut her stomach open, let that black unborn child fall out, and then stomp its head in the ground. I show you books where they write about this. I name them to you. Slave trade by fear. From slavery to freedom by Pope Franklin. Uh, Negro family in the USA. Frazier uh, touches on, touches on some of them all night long. Uh, Anti-slavery uh, by Dwight Lowell DeMond. I cite your books all night long where they rank themselves on what they did to you and me and got nervous to say, we teach hate because we're talking about what they did. Why, they're lucky. Really, they're lucky. They're fortunate. Slaves used to sing that song about, my Lord's going to move this wicked curse and raise up a righteous nation that would obey. They knew what they were talking about. They were talking about the man. They used to sing the song, uh, uh, good news, and charity is coming. If you know that every thing they sang, no spiritualists were talking about going to get away from here. None of them wanted to stay here. Only one of you, the one sitting around here now, like a now on the law, want to say that you're supposed to be educated in this. You're supposed to know what's happening, you know. They're not supposed to know what's happening, but everything they sang, every song, had a hint in it that they weren't satisfied here, that they weren't being treated right, that somebody had to go. The slave maker knew that he couldn't make these people slaves until he first made him dumb. And one of the best ways to make a man dumb is to take his tongue. Take his language. Even a man who can't talk, what do they call him? A dummy. 
Once your language is gone, you are done. You can't communicate with people who are your relatives. You can never have access to information from your family. You just can't communicate. So, and also if you notice, the natural tongue that one speaks is referred to as one's mother tongue. Mother tongue. And the natural uh, intelligence that a person has before he goes to school is called mother wit. Not father wit. It's called mother wit because everything a child knows before it gets to school, it learns from its mother, not its father. And if it never goes to school, whatever native intelligence it has, it got it primarily from its mother. Not his father, so it's called mother wit. And the mother is also the one who teaches the child how to speak its language. So that natural tongue is called mother tongue. Whenever you find the same people as we, who aren't able to speak any mother tongue, well, that's evidence right there, something was done to our mother. Something had to have happened to her. And uh, they had laws in those days that made it mandatory for a child to be taken, for a black child, to be taken from his mother as fast as that child was born. The mother never had a chance to rear really. The child would be brought up somewhere else, away from the mother, so that the mother couldn't teach the child what she knew about itself, about her past, about its heritage. It would have to grow up in complete darkness, knowing nothing about the land where it came from or the people that it came from, not even about its own mother. It was, there was no relationship between the black child and his mother was against the law. And if the master would ever find any of those children who had any knowledge of his mother tongue, that child was put to death, they had to stand out the language. It is scientific to find any one of them that could speak off on his head, or they would put it to death. They would kill it in front of the mother, in front of the mother, if necessary. This is history. This is how they took your language. You didn't lose it. It didn't evaporate. They took it with a scientific process because they knew they had to take it to make it dumb or into the dummy that you and I now are. I read in some books where it said that some of the slave mothers would uh, try and be tricky in order to teach their child who would be off in another field somewhere. They, would, they themselves would be praying and they'd pray in a loud voice and in their own language. And the child in the distant field would hear his mother's voice and he'd learn how to pray the same way. And in learning how to pray, he'd pick up on some of the language. And the master found that this was being done, and immediately he stepped up his efforts to kill all of those children that were benefiting from this. And so it became against the law, even for the slave to be caught praying in his tongue if he knew it. It was against the law. You've heard some of the people say they had to pray with their head in the bucket. Well, they weren't praying to, to the Jesus that they're praying to now. Then the white man let you call on that Jesus all day long. That he'll make it possible for you to call on him. But you will call on somebody else then that he had more fear of. And then and, and you're calling on that somebody else in that other language that caused him a bit of fear, a bit of fright. They used to have to steal away and pray. All those songs that the slaves uh, uh, taught or sang and called spiritual had wrapped up in it some of what was happening to him. And when the child realized it couldn't hear its mother pray anymore, the slaves would then come up with a song, I wouldn't, I couldn't hear nobody pray, or uh, the song, motherless child, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Father gone, mother gone, uh, motherless child sees a hard time. All of these songs were describing what was happening to us then in the only way the slaves knew how to communicate, in song. They didn't dare say it outright, so they put it in song. They pretended that they were singing about Moses in the land, go down Moses. They didn't, they weren't talking about Moses and tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. They were trying to talk, some kind of talk to each other over the slave master's head. Now you got a hold of the thing and you believing in it for real. You really, yeah, I, I hear you singing go down Moses and you still talking about Moses 4,000 years ago. You ought to go by But those slaves had a whole lot to sing. Everything they sang was designed for freedom, designed for going back home, or designed for getting this big white ink off their back. For 300 years, we stayed in that level. We stayed at that level. 
Finally, we got to where we had no language, no history, no name. The white man named them after himself. Jones, Smith, Johnson, Bunch, and names like those. <laughs> we couldn't speak our own language. We had none. And he then began to teach us that we came from a jungle where, there, where the people had no language. This is the crime that he committed. He convinced us that our people back home were savages, animals in the jungle. And the reason we couldn't talk was because we never had a language. And we grew up thinking that we never had one. And in the meantime, while he was working on us, his brother in England, and in France, and in Belgium, and in uh, uh, Spain, and in Italy, and in Germany, was working on the African continent. While he was working on us over here, they were running wild on the African continent, storming out all signs that ever there was a civilization over there. They could slay them over there too. And by working together as partners, the man on the European continent in cahoots with this white man on the American continent succeeded in taking over Africa and Asia and the entire world while we went to sleep. And then in 1865, he came up with a trick pretending that he was fighting the Civil War to set us free. But he wasn't to set us free. He came up with another trick that he was issuing an emancipation proclamation to set us free, which he wasn't to set us free. And then he came up also pretending that he was putting some amendments to the Constitution to set us free, which it wasn't to set us free. And then later on he came up with a Supreme Court decision which he said was to give us free access to better education, which it wasn't to do that. And then last year he came up with a bill that he called also to give us more freedom, which it also wasn't to do that. Any man who will know the level of civilization that we started out on and came from, any man who knows the criminal deeds that was done to us by his people to bring us to the level that we've been on for the past 300 years is so deceptive, so deceitful, so criminally deceitful that it's almost beyond his or desire to come up with anything meaningful that will undo what has been done to us over the past 300 years. It is absolutely necessary. Anything that is done for us has to be done by us. 